All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third of our five nights of uh, Google Hangouts, talking about the different threats related to the monsoon season. My name is Tim Bryce, and I'm a meteorologist or a forecaster with the National Weather Service in El Paso, Texas. And I'll be kind of hosting things tonight, but I am by far not the expert on this subject. But I, I will tell you that this is one of my favorite light, uh, one of my favorite subjects, and we'll be talking about lightning. I've always been kind of fascinated, as actually, uh, I think humankind for the last three or four thousand years has been fascinated by lightning. Um, but it's only recently that we've kind of begun to understand it. Uh, and uh, and I'm, I'm glad to say, you know, 40, 50 years ago, we had a lot of lightning fatalities. And in the last few years, we've really seen that number starting to decline with the different campaigns that the Weather Service and other uh, organizations like the Red Cross uh, and FEMA have been putting out there to kind of get the message out to be safe. Uh, this lightning can kill you. Uh, and, you know, some of the safety tips. And we're going to cover all of that tonight. We're going to talk about how lightning is formed, uh, different kinds of lightning, and um, we're going to uh, talk about those safety tips. So I really appreciate you joining us. Uh, before I forget, I'm going to do it one minute into the Hangout. The last uh, couple Hangouts have been very bad about mentioning the hashtag. So one minute into the hash uh, Hangout, I'm going to mention we will be trying to answer your questions. Uh, so if you want to tweet at us, if you have Twitter, use the hashtag, uh, hashtag, uh, monsoon 2019 and then have your question in there and be happy to answer it. If you have Twitter, you can send me a quick email at tim.brice at noaa.gov and that's N-O-A-A dot G-O-V and I'd be happy to answer that, you know, read it out to our panelists to answer that question. And speaking of our panelists, I'd also like to kind of run down the line here and introduce everyone real quickly. Uh, actually from the El Paso office is the Warning Coordination Meteorologist, Jason Laney. How are you, sir? Hey, doing very good. Thanks for having me back, Tim. You bet, Jim. Glad you could join us. From the Flagstaff office, we have Miss Emily Thornton. She's a forecaster up there. How are you doing, Miss Emily? Doing well. Very good. Hey, and, you know, she's up in the Flagstaff area, so they're up in elevation. So I'm looking forward to you to be ta helping us kind of uh, flesh out and talk about uh, outdoor safety when it comes to lightning because you have so many people out there camping and doing those outdoor activities. Absolutely. It's good to have a plan and know how you will protect yourself if you're going to be outdoors this season. Very good. Very good. Then we got uh, Mr. Dan Gregoria. He's over in the San Diego office. How are you doing, Dan? Hey, doing well. Good to be here talking lightning. Very good. And, you know, Dan has kind of the, uh, a similar but opposite problem. Instead of being up at elevation like Miss Emily is, he's got people standing on the beach looking out there when thunderstorms come across. So, again, a, a place where people are at risk, but I, you know, he can help us talk about the safety and things associated with that. Definitely. Very good. And kind of our technical expert uh, is the newly minted doctor, Ms. Uh, Tyla Zhang. Uh, she just finished her, her PhD at the University of uh, Arizona and is now moving on to postdoc work at the University of Maryland, all with an emphasis on lightning. How are you doing, Dr. Zhang? Ooh, I like to say that. <laughs> yes. Very good. I, I'm sure you like to hear that now that you're after all your hard work. Very good. So, all righty. So, you know, one of the first things that I'm going to throw out and, and kind of show everybody, because I, I don't think people realize how many people are killed every year. And Jason, can you pull up that the bar graph of the, the fatalities related to the weather, please? Um, because, oh, boom. Wow. That's impressive. So I'll just <laughs> go over here because, um, after you, you, you look through uh, heat and flood, you know, it used to be, if I bet you if we went back 30, 40 years, lightning would be much, much higher. But the really the good news is that we are definitely seeing a downward trend there for lightning. You can see the 30-year average is at 43, but then the 10-year average is down to 27. And the, uh, the, the in last year, we only had 20. So it definitely looks like the campaigns uh, work, the different campaigns that we've been working on in the Weather Service and Red Cross, FEMA, all of them have definitely been making a difference. But unfortunately, um, one, uh, one lightning fatality is too many. And uh, thank you, thank you. So, uh, so you know, I, uh, you know, one lightning fatality is, is, is too many. And I've got this map kind of, kind of showing the spatial distribution um, of where the lightning fatalities were for the last 
uh, from 2008 to 2007. And no surprise, uh, in the lightning capital of the United States, down there in Florida, there's they've had a lot. Uh, but other places uh, uh, like Texas, uh, you know, places that have uh, elevation. Ele I know that Colorado has played with it with people up in the mountains, and and no surprise also in Arizona where people are out and about a lot. And we're gonna, we're kind of talking about we'll talk about you know what you know people are doing when they are struck by lightning. The different they've done all these studies to try to figure out who and where and what they were doing to kind of help you know mitigate or you know let you be aware that you know if you're out uh, playing golf, we all kind of aware. Of, you know, if you're out playing golf, swinging these metal clubs and there's lightning around, you're more at risk. Uh, but, you know, people don't realize just riding your motorcycle, uh, working in the in, in the yard, uh, swimming and things like that uh, are also putting you at risk. But, you know, uh, before we get into it too far, I was wondering if uh, Ms. Tyla, if, uh, Dr. Zhang, can uh, talk to us about how lightning forms. What is the, 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 the exact physical process in the cloud? And um, I'll try to throw up some graphics as you're talking along here. Okay, so when um, there's hot air um, and you have uh, you have to form the convection, and these convection makes the air go up. And when the air go up, uh, some of the um, uh, particles in the atmosphere, like the water vapor, ice crystals, they would collect with um, each other, and these co collision will um, make the particles, uh, will charge the particles. So some of the uh, particles will be, uh, will be uh, positively charged and some particles will be negatively charged. So when the electric field between these particles um, exceed a certain threshold, it will um, make, it will form the lightning. Very good, very good. So I like to tell people, because I've got this graphic up on the screen, that just like you said, uh, as those particles kind of bounce into each other and rub up against each other, um, they, it turns the thunderstorm into a big giant battery where it's it's po you know it's positive on one end and it's negative on the other. But unlike a battery, that charge keeps building up and building up, building up until, like you said, it, it reaches a certain threshold and then it has to discharge itself uh, in the form of a lightning bolt. And um, inside that cloud, a lot of times, the vast majority of, if I'm not mistaken, and you can correct me, uh, but the vast majority of the lightning is in cloud. It stays in the cloud. It's only a, a, a lower percentage. I, I don't know if I, I know the percentage off the top of my head uh, that is actually cloud to ground lightning that we see. But, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people are familiar with, uh, on like a cold winter night, if you're shuffling across the carpet and you reach for that doorknob, zzz, you get that zap. Uh, and it was that shuffling motion across the carpet that built up that static charge. And then when you reached out for a metal object, doorknob or whatever, you got that zap. It is very, a very similar process to give us, that's what gives us that, that lightning. And um, let me see what Mr. Jason's got. Oh, he's got all the different kinds of lightning. Um, so yeah, so the, that, that static charge building up is what, uh, you know, as things are rubbing together in the cloud, it builds up that charge and eventually uh, gives you that discharge. Uh, Jason, can you walk us through the different kinds of lightning here? Ah, well, actually, I'm missing one in this. What I was actually looking for, you talked about in cloud lightning. That's where the positive and negative polarities are attracted to each other within the cloud itself. And we see that a lot of time when you see a cloud illuminate, yet you don't see evidence of any actual lightning bolt coming down towards the ground or stretching out through the air. But that said, there is cloud to air lightning. Sometimes the lightning doesn't actually strike the ground. It just kind of moves on out through the open space of air around it. But Really, a lot of the lightning that we see actually jumps from one cloud to another. Cloud in, in cloud lightning is probably the most prevalent, then cloud to cloud lightning. And actually, the one that we see probably the least of, which of course is the most dangerous and the one that we try to track most for people and alert people to, that would be the cloud to ground lightning. But whenever we're dealing with some of these situations out there, especially say we're dealing with our emergency management community, there's a football game going on, a soccer match, baseball, whatever the case may be, uh, even if we're not seeing cloud to ground lightning strikes, the moment we start seeing any particular cloud producing lightning, at which point it obviously becomes a thunderstorm, uh, we do alert them to its location so that they can take the proper actions. 
And you know we're gonna we're gonna come back to visit this because you know when, when we were talking on Monday we talked about heat and we talked about all the heat products that the National Weather Service is, uh, issues, and then yesterday we talked about downward wind and dust storms and haboobs and we talked about all the dust products that we issue. Uh, but we'll go in later about all the many many lightning products that we issue, right? No, we Why don't. Not? Yeah, we, we don't issue lightning products. Um, I guess we Why can talk not? about that real quickly right now. Um, anybody want to chime in here, Dan or, or Emily? Why doesn't the Weather Service issue like a lightning warning like we do a thunderstorm warning? Yeah, Dan, San Diego here. We would just issue just a plethora of warnings. I mean, too many <laughs> warnings, and we don't want to overwarn the public. Um, every thunderstorm contains lightning. And so really, if we warned on lightning, we would be warning really on every single thunderstorm out there. And that's a great point. Um, plus, you know, I've always kind of pictured it that it, it's lightning is it's it's contained around the, the thunderstorm, but it's still pretty random within that that area. Space. So trying to give someone a warning, you'd have to cover the whole thunderstorm and, you know, Thunderstorms vary on the number of lightning strikes that they have in them, and it can be a few or even a lot. Like you said, whew, trying to nail that down to uh, just, uh, the exact area where that lightning is going to form. Uh, I do know, like Jason mentioned, that we have been getting more into the realm of working with our partners and helping them to know when lightning, uh, you know, a thunderstorm uh, is approaching a venue or something so that they can take appropriate action. Uh, that's probably the, the, you know, the most that we could do is that, hey, there's a thunderstorm approaching a place that has people in a vulnerable, you know, a fair, uh, you know, a number of people in a vulnerable position, whether it's, it's at a concert or in a stadium or something like that. Uh, because, you know, I know that we work with our high school football teams uh, in the fall to, and there, you know, there are all these stadiums all around uh, El Paso that are, are challenges uh, as thunderstorms are approaching them that they have to stop play and move indoors. I, I do think I've seen in the last probably five years very, uh, very good movement forward from these different large venue uh, facilities. Uh, anywhere from the professional Major League Baseball uh, through the college ranks, I've, I've seen every year. It seems like I'm seeing more and more uh, college games that are delayed because of thunderstorms and lightning in the area. Uh, same thing for baseball, and now it's working its way down to high schools and, and things like that. And I think it's caught the attention of our, our the emergency management community. Uh, so uh, you know, helping protect those people out there. But we're still working to to make it work all the way down to the individual person. And Miss Emily, I was wondering if you could kind of touch on real quickly um, if you are, a, let's say. Uh, before we go into all different directions, but if you're uh, if you're out camping or you're outside at the soccer field, what are some of the safety precautions that someone could take uh, to stay safe from lightning? Well, I think the biggest thing to remember is to have a plan, uh, and part of that plan should certainly be checking the forecast before you go. Um, when you head out for the day, having some idea of what time and where thunderstorms might be uh, can be a great thing to know, but you know, many times you're going to be outside just enjoying yourself and uh, kind of get caught by surprise maybe by a thunderstorm. Uh, and having a plan ahead of time of what to do if that happens uh, is a good thing to communicate between you and your family or you and your friends uh, um, who you're going with. So some tips from that. Um, if you are up in a higher elevation area, say on top of a hilltop or if you're hiking along a mountain trail, uh, the number one thing you want to do is to get to lower ground immediately. Um, you don't want to be on the top of a ridge line or on top of a peak or on top of a hill. Um, so number one thing would be to move to lower ground. Um, after you sort of get to that safer lower ground, you want to avoid open fields. Um, a lot of times the misconception with lightning is that, um, you know, they are attract that lightning is attracted to metal objects or metal poles, uh, things like that. And uh, typically, you know, lightning is most concerned with the tallest object, um, be that a tree, be that a metal pole, or be that a person. Uh, so you certainly don't want to be out in an open field where you would be the tallest object. 
Um, aside from that, um, you know, kind of bridging forward from that, you don't want to be near large trees. Um, you know, again, if lightning's, uh, you know, typically going to hit the tallest object in an area, uh, you don't want to be next to that tallest object. Even if you are not hit directly, um, you can be hit from the side flash from, uh, you know, currents moving off of the main step leader. Uh, so you want to be away from tall objects. Um, a lot of times people uh, will say to me when I'm out, uh, giving talks that, uh, you know, they wanted, they thought they should lay flat on the ground or they thought that they should get together with their group. Um, lightning is very conductive. It is electricity. So as a lightning strike uh, hits the ground, it spreads out. So um, increasing your surface area along the ground is not something you want to do. You want to maybe crouch down low uh, into a crouching position. And then in addition, you want to uh, spread out from the people you're with. Uh, you know, certainly if one of you uh, is hit by lightning, there's danger that the rest of you could um, receive some of the current from that lightning strike. So spread out from your group. Um, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully um, you are near a shelter. Uh, a shelter would be an area with four walls and a door. Uh, so not a tent, not an open air awning. Um, you want walls, a roof and a door uh, for a good lightning safety shelter. Uh, if that's not available to you, if you're on a trail that maybe doesn't have those things, again, crouching uh, into a low position is a good idea. As well, trying to make it back to your car. Uh, your car is better than being outside uh, exposed to the outdoors. So if you can get back to your vehicle, uh, that's another good thing to do as well. So just remembering to move off of um, higher terrain like uh, hilltops and mountaintops and ridgelines. Stay away from tall objects. Uh, spread out from your group. Uh, and uh, enter a crouching position if you can't get into a sturdy structure with four walls and doors. Very, very, very good words of advice. Now, I, I want to show a picture here. Some people might find it a, a little um, disturbing, but it is a group of cows that were standing in a tree, just like Miss Emily said, and they were the lightning struck the tree and it killed them all. And um, so it just goes to show you that power of that lightning, um, that you do not want to be under a tree. Um, that I've, I've seen plenty of, of pictures just like that one. I, I've seen pictures of, you know, uh, cows that are up against a fence line uh, when lightning struck somewhere on the fence line. And um, that electricity spreads out both ways on that, that fence line. And unfortunately, those cows are, are, are also killed. So it, it just kind of, I, I, I wanted to show people that just so that they have an understanding that those could just as easily be people if you, if you ran under that tree uh, to, you know, a lot of people, I, when I talk to the kids, I say that, you know, a lot of people tell me, I don't get, it's raining, I don't want to get my hair wet or something like that, so I'm going to go stand under a tree. And, you know, that's, that's just not a wise thing to do when it comes to lightning safety, because uh, like Emily said, like we've seen, that lightning will strike the top of the tree. It's going to the, you know, the, the, the it's going to the highest object uh, and it's going to make its way. It actually makes a spiral kind of corkscrew down that tree. Uh, just under the the bark of the tree and that where the water is and the, and the pulp uh, and then spreads out through all the root system. If you ever stood under a tree, you see all the roots. Uh, well, that just is the, the channel that that lightning is going to follow as it, as it moves out in all directions. So uh, definitely not a good place to be, you know, um, and, and one of you guys can, can chime in this, you know, and we may touch on a couple of myths, but one of the myths that uh, I, I see floated around from time to time is um, if I have like my cell phone, if I have, uh, you know, a, uh, I'm going to go old school, like a Walkman or some kind of metal object necklace on my, my, uh, my person that I'm more at risk for being struck by lightning because I've got metal because lightning is, a, you know, attracted to metal. Uh, do you guys know, is there any truth to that kind of myth? I'll jump in for a little bit. Um, I get that a lot when I'm out getting talks as well. And um, you know, I think that a lot of that stems from the fact that traditional lightning rods are usually metal. Um, the reason why that is used is because that's a great way to take that uh, current and channel it into the ground. But the lightning is not inherently um, attracted to that metal pole. So maybe like the steeple of a church or a taller skyscraper, um, you might see those uh, lightning rods on top of those type of buildings. Um, it's because they are already a tall object. Um, so the odds are better for, you know, that tall steeple or that tall skyscraper to take a hit. So that lightning rod is put in place 
uh, to take that current and travel it away from the building and down into the ground. And I think because of that, I think a lot of people associate metal and, um, you know, that type of thing with attracting lightning. Um, and as you said earlier, um, you know, and as other people commented on earlier, uh, it's very random. <laughs> you know, there's no, uh, there's no way to scientifically say this is where lightning will hit and we're 100% certain. You know, it's going to be kind of at random. So, you know, the lightning's not being attracted per se to metal items so much as we use those to direct the current um, back into the ground. Right, right. I, I tell when I talk to kids in the schools, I tell them, you know, lightning does not like to travel through the atmosphere. It likes to go, it likes to, the atmosphere is actually very um, non-conductive to lightning. Uh, if it has to go that way, it will. Uh, once that charge, like Dr. Uh, Dr. Zhang had mentioned, once that charge builds up, it, it overcomes that, that that insulation process. But if it can choose as it's going through the air, if it can find uh, a, a, something made out of metal or something made out of water uh, and some tall object that it can get to, it will much rather choose to go through those objects. So I tell those kids in school, you know, we're not robots. We're not made out of metal, but guess what? We're mostly made out of water. And if the lightning has to choose between going through you or the air, it's going to choose you every single time because you are, you know, water and metal are both better conductors of electricity than the air. And it's always just looking for the the, the, the fastest way to the ground. And I did want to, you know, speaking of that, I'll show this. This is my favorite video to show. Uh, but I, I like to show this uh, because it kind of demonstrates this, this process that we're talking about. This is super duper slow-mo of lightning. And what you're initially seeing here is that it's actually, this is part of the lightning that is too faint for our eyes and it's moving too fast. We don't actually see this part of the lightning, but each of these little step leaders or these fingers are reaching down. And the first one that touches the ground, that's what gets to be, that's what carries all that charge. It makes that electrical, it makes that electrical connection. I'll back it up and do it one more time here. Oop, let me back it up a little further. Um, but this is, you can see, it's kind of like a race, whichever the, 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 the electricity is feeling its way through the atmosphere, trying to find the fastest, most efficient way to the ground and if it can find a tree or a, a building or something and make that connection boom that's what it's going to do and unfortunately if it finds a person at the end of that it will choose that person over the air because uh, it just wants to find the most efficient way to uh, get that that electrical charge uh, discharge from the cloud because it's just building up and building up inside the, the cloud now, now dr zhang i, I want to go back to you real quickly because there's, there's two kinds of lightning. We talked about how a thunderstorm ends up being kind of like a, 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 a dipole with our kind of like a battery with a plus side and a negative side. Um, is, is there different kinds of lightning? Is there, is there positive lightning and, and negative lightning? Yes. So uh, there are two types of um, polarity of lightning, negative ones and positive ones. Uh, usually uh, we have um, 90 percent, 95 percent of the uh, cloud to ground lightning as being negative and only five percent um, being positive. But in some of the Great Plain, um, the thunderstorms in the summertime, they have um, diverse thunderstorms polarity. So they have more like 40 to 50 percent of the um, cloud to ground lightning being positive. And wow. usually positive lightning are more intense. It's more in, uh, dangerous. So, in, and I've, I've heard that as well. So, so what you're saying is that the, when it comes to lightning, you know, if lightning's bad either way you look at it, but positive lightning carries more charge. And I think if I remember right, actually there's, it lasts longer. That current is actually traveling a little longer. So uh, it is much more likely in the case of like starting a forest fire or starting a fire in a house, positive lightning is much more likely to start uh, some kind of fire than say it, the, the negative lightning. Does that sound yeah. about right? It does. As a matter of fact, Tim, I, I, ha I have a good friend here who's working with me here in the weather service. His name is Google. And uh, <laughs> I have to be honest, I was just checking this as you guys were talking about it because it raised some curiosity. And what I'm reading here is that the typical negative charge, negative uh, charged lightning strike uh, produces about 30,000 amps of electricity. And it says that positive lightning can be up to 10 times greater than that. So that that is very amazing. And the amps, just if I remember right in my basic uh, electrical, that's just kind of the, the amount of energy that it's pushing through at any one time. It's it's not the volts that'll get you, it's the amps that'll get you in the, in the it, when you're talking about electricity. So it is impressive that that, that positive 
Um, Dr. Zhang, do we do we un, do we know why positive lightning strikes are just so kind of different than the negative strikes? Uh, so in a typical thunderstorm, um, the negative charge layer is in the middle of the storm, and the positive charge layer is um, on the top. Um, so when you have a positively charged lightning going down to the ground, it has to um, go through a lot more um, distance. Yes, as shown in this figure. So the positive layer is up in the uh, top layer. So it takes um, a lot of distance to come down to the ground. So only when it's very intense that could um, get to the ground. So that's... Yeah, make it all the way down. Very true. Very good. Perfect. You know, and, and this kind of leads us into the next thing. Dan, can you kind of comment on, there, there's such a thing that's called the bolt from the blue. And, and I think that kind of leads into this uh, lightning the, from the top part of the thunderstorm. Can you kind of explain what bolt from the blue is? Uh, yes, exactly. So these bolts from the blue you might have heard about, uh, they're actually of the positive lightning charge and it comes out from the top of the thunderstorm. Uh, it can be clear sky at your location uh, and lightning can actually be striking. And what's happening is it's striking from uh, usually the anvil of the thunderstorm cell. So the very tall anvil cloud of the thunderstorm uh, lightning can be coming from that. And it can be coming some 10 plus miles from the thunderstorm. So I think it's real important for people to realize it doesn't have to be raining at your location uh, for you to be in danger of lightning striking because lightning strikes uh, 10 plus miles away from thunderstorms. Um, and you know, here in the desert Southwest, sometimes we have dry lightning. So that may not be so new to you that lightning strikes where it's not raining, but if it's, uh, pouring rain and then the thunderstorm leaves and you have sunny skies returning, uh, wait until that cell moves away. We say about uh, 30 minutes after the last sound of thunder. So yeah, these uh, lightning strikes, especially the positive charges or bolts from the blue are very dangerous. And I'll just give one example. Uh, back in 2014 here in Southern California on the beach, at, this was in Venice Beach. Uh, people were in the water. It was a sunny day. A thunderstorm developed near the beach, and it wasn't on top of the beach. And we uh, there was one death and 13 injuries as a lightning bolt struck the ocean uh, with people on the beach and in the water. So yeah, we here at uh, San Diego National Weather Service, if we see any lightning threat, we're calling uh, the beach, the lifeguards to warn of that impending hazard very good and it just just shows you that you know it, you can be just not minding your own business and trying to have a good time and all of a sudden uh boom and, and like emily said it's a good idea you know you don't uh, you know you don't want to change your plans but you do want to have a plan that if you do see thunderstorm approaching you uh you see those those building those clouds building up it's a good idea just to to move out of hazard's way. And uh, I'll let anyone chime in here because we're going to talk about one of the, the more successful uh, lightning campaigns that the Weather Service has. Uh, and that is, uh, anyone can come on, comment on this, uh, is when thunder roars, go indoors. I exactly what are we trying to say there uh, when we're talking about when thunder roars, go indoors? Well, I'll be the first to chime in on that one, and that's because uh, whenever we're educating the public and talking to people, we always say uh, a general rule of thumb is if you're close enough to a storm to actually hear the thunder, then you're definitely close enough to the storm to be struck by lightning. A lot of that has to do with uh, the general science there that light travels much faster than sound does. So obviously, by the time you can hear it, if it gets to you, uh, and it's got to go through a lot of atmosphere to get there, that possibly that lightning strike is closer than you think. Uh, what's the rule of thumb? About every five seconds is about a mile. Is that correct? That's exactly right. 
Yeah, so you see the lightning flash, you count five seconds, obviously that means that the storm or the lightning was only about a mile away, and the next flash, if it's less time than that, it's getting a little closer. And I've, I've seen that actually displayed in movies before, but that's a good thing that we talk about. And uh, Tim, can you explain to everybody what we mean by when we talk about the 30-30 rule? So the 30-30 rule basically comes down to, and you'll, you'll have to remind me exactly, but what you do is you um, you wait. Once you hear thunder and lightning, when thunder roars, you go indoors. But then, you know, when do, when is it safe to go back outside? Is it mm -hmm. is it five minutes? Is it 10 minutes? And when we tell people, you need to wait 30 minutes until you've heard that last clap of thunder before you can go outside. And so we tell people, you know, once you hear that last clap of thunder, you still need to wait 30 minutes because like Dan said, that that lightning can actually reach way out behind the the thunderstorm cloud even after it's gone by you to 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 that could strike your location so it's always best uh to to just wait out the storm wait and count you know wait until 30 uh 30 uh minutes have gone by uh to see uh that the thunderstorm has passed by and um, you can go uh you can go back out to to um the um whatever activity you're doing of course the other 30 uh is that if it's uh if the lightning's less than 30 seconds away you need to seek shelter and you know so if, if you can hear if you see lightning and the thunder's less than 30 seconds away that means it's less than six miles away from you uh, and like like dan was saying actually the the thunderstorms can reach out 10 uh 10 miles or so um, so if you can hear thunder it's probably within about 10 miles of you so you know, if you see that flash and then less than 30 seconds later you hear thunder, uh, I, I tell you, I, I would just say if you hear thunder, whether it's five seconds or 45 seconds, go inside. Uh, and then after that thunderstorm has gone by, you wait about 30 minutes uh, to go out back outside. And I know here in the southwest, uh, many times because I, I can I can hear people um, kind of complaining, say, oh, I'll be inside all day, you know. That's one of the great things about living in the Southwest is that, especially during the monsoon season, we get a round of thunderstorms, they come in, they do their thing, and then they move on pretty quickly. So, you know, you go, you hear that thunder, you go inside, maybe you're inside 30, 45 minutes, an hour, but after that time, that thunderstorm dissipated or moved on. It's it's unusual to have hour after hour after hour of thun thunderstorm during the monsoon season. Can't, I'm not going to say it doesn't happen, but it, it's more unusual that that, that would happen. So. You know, listening, uh, uh, listening, and waiting for that uh, thirty minutes after you heard that last lightning or that last thunderclap, uh, and then um, <clears throat> you know, I know that parts of the weather service were also looking at the deaf community. So when you say thunder roars, go indoors, that does that does not translate well in the deaf community because they're like we don't hear thunder. So there's another saying that when you see a flash, dash. Uh, so they're they're talking about uh, when you see the lightning in the deaf community, head indoors to be safe. Uh, and, and, you know, um, there's a there's a neat website. Uh, if you go to weather.gov slash safety, and I'll, and I'll try to pull it up here real quick, um, that has all these uh, safety uh, information on it for all the different kind of threats that are related uh, to weather. And um, one of those, of course, is uh, lightning and uh, you can you can click on it and there's all kinds of material on there you can see here lightning i'll just jump right into the lightning safety uh, but you've got all kinds of we didn't even talk about that that the lightning is really really hot you know hotter than the surface of the sun but <laughs> i'm a squirrel i saw that saw something caught my attention there but um you can see there's there's uh animations there, there's books that the kids can uh, you know uh, color in uh, it talks about lightning victims, uh, their survivors. We have a lot of uh, a lot of information in Spanish, uh, so uh, I think that this lightning resource is great. You can see there's there's a section for teachers to talk about with the, their students. We've got uh, toolkits for venues and organizations. So this resource, uh, like I said, weather.gov/safety/ in this case lightning is is a great resource. Dan, did you wanna did you wanna chime in with something? Uh, yes, I just wanted to mention, you know, that rule when thunder roars goes indoors is excellent. But I always tell people to, you know, watch our forecast information. If thunderstorms are in the forecast, say you're out boating, uh, watch the clouds. If you see those huge like cauliflower 
uh, shaped clouds that are really growing fast. There's always that first strike and, and that can kill too. So really, if you just observe the weather around you, if thunderstorms are in the forecast and skies look threatening, and especially if you're out on the water, it's really time to seek shelter even before I would say you hear the thunder. Yeah, because you know one of the challenges that you have when you're out on the water in a boat is if you look around you, when you're out in the ocean or out in the middle of a lake, guess what? Guess who's the tallest object? You are. Um, so the, the challenge is that you need to actually anticipate because just like Dan says, if you hear thunder, you're the tallest object out on that lake or out, on, uh, out in the ocean. And it, you know, I've been on a boat. You, you can't just like be to shore in a few seconds. It takes a little time. Uh, so you need to actually be a little proactive. If you start to see, like Dan said, the buildups, start to head into shore just to be safe, just to be safe. Hey, um, Jason, I'm, I'm going to switch subjects here and go back to Dr. Zhang. Uh, you had a picture up there, the lightning mapper. Uh, and I was wondering if, if Dr. Zhang, if you could uh, walk us through what Jason has up on his screen here. Okay. Because this is some of the new technology that we have with our new uh, GO satellites, right? Yes. That's called a geostationary lightning mapper on the GO 16 and 17 um, satellites. Um, so these are the, um, um, so I'm not yeah, this, sure. Uh, this, one, this one is the count. I'll bring up the density next if you want to talk about both of those. And so this is probably, is that the 15 minute um, lightning density? Uh, yeah, it's, it's the total flash count density in kilometers for 15 minutes, I believe. So yeah, it shows you kind of where the convection developed and propagate. Um, so the red uh, colors are where um, you have more lightning and um, usually lightning goes um, uh, correlate with um, the convection core. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of see how the thunderstorm developed. Now, I, I have a quick question. I have a question for you as Jason's going to pull up the, the other map here. You know, we have a, a pretty robust lightning detection network that does a real good job of capturing where all these cloud to ground lightning strikes are. Well, how is having this uh, lightning mapper in the, in the, the ghost satellite, how is that different or uh, how does that uh, augment that uh, that lightning detection network that we have across the United States? So the um, the lightning national lightning detection network um, we're using are uh, ground from the ground based and they are detecting the uh, very low frequency to low frequency which um, is more likely to detect the cloud to ground lightning and this but the satellite however, um, they're detecting the optical um, emission. Oh, okay. So um, they're de they're detecting the um, different portions um, of lightning. Uh, the cool thing for the satellite products is that um, we have found that if we see an uh, a rapid increase in the lightning count, um, we will have a pro. A very likely to have a severe um, like wind or tornadoes um, within like 15 to 20 minutes. So that's um, lightning products is a um, very good, um, give you a good lead time to forecasting the, um, the tornado or severe um, wind. Ah, very good. And, and Jason, real quickly, is, is this actually real time stuff right now? Actually, yes, it is. This is real time. You can see the time up here. If I were to stop my particular loop here and go through it, you can see this last one was, uh, well, uh, not a little bit while ago. I guess it's not exactly real time. We're off by a couple of minutes. 
but this is certainly kind of moving through uh, through the day there. So what's that at uh, 20 minutes and 51 seconds past? So we're, we're probably about 15, 20 minutes delayed here with this particular product. But the neat thing is I found this product online and anybody who's watching can actually have access to these products. This is actually through the uh, Colorado State uh, website, EDU, that I pulled up this Zero Ram stuff. But uh, you can Google, look for it, look for the GOES uh, satellite, uh, Lightning Mappers. It's a very amazing product. And of course, it sees everything that the satellite does, even down into parts of South America. And the cool thing is, we have these on a couple of different satellites here. This, of course, is the GOES 16, which is uh, the first big high definition satellite that we put in space. But we have one that goes off to the west as yet well. And of course, that's nice and pretty. But let me take it on back down to the to the density of the lightning. And since we're here in the desert southwest, this is probably one we would want to focus on a little bit more. And you can see that fairly quiet day. So monsoon season is just about upon us, but at least we're getting a little bit of a break this afternoon. Very good. I, I did want to remind everyone real quickly, um, if you do have a question that you can use that hashtag, uh, hashtag monsoon Month, hashtag monsoon 2019 or drop me a quick email at tim.brice b-r-i-c-e at noaa.gov and we'd be happy to answer your questions all right what i can't believe 40 minutes has gone by i, I just love hey, talking mr. about lightning mr I, tim uh, i got one for you i was just checking the twitter someone has actually written into us and i think we'll all enjoy the little sense of humor here it says if a thunderstorm took antidepressants would it make it only produce positive strikes by doom uh that sounds like our boss our boss likes uh, jokes like that i wonder if he sent that in <laughs> no it was not him and someone else wrote uh, do giraffes count as tall structures <laughs> 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 so uh hey, the folks do have a little sense of humor of course it's fun to talk about that but we are definitely talking about a serious subject no doubt oh well, but yeah. did you hear that you all heard that on the news i believe it was yesterday or today that two giraffes were killed by lightning no. Yeah. It's amazing. I where that was. It does happen. And, um, you know, they're, they, they would qualify as a tall object, especially if they're out at the zoo, uh, out in the middle of their pen, or out in the savanna of Africa. They're definitely going to be sticking up there, just like we were talking about uh, what, what you shouldn't want to be doing. All right. Um, I'm going to go down through some lightning myths. And I was uh, wondering if you guys could all just Whoever wants to to chime in and either say yes, that's true, or say no, that's false, and why. So, one of the lightning myths that we always hear is that uh, lightning doesn't strike the same place twice. I'm going to say false for two hundred. That is that is true. What? But so, can you give some examples of you know why that isn't true? Well, uh, because it is attracted to tall objects, I know for a fact that the the Empire State Building, I had a chance to visit it just last year. It's got a huge lightning rod on top of it, and they tell us that that thing is struck many, many times throughout the year. So I know that place gets hit more than once. That's true. Let's see. Uh, according to our good friend Google again, the Empire State Building is struck on average 23 times every year by lightning. So... Uh, definitely, definitely not true. Lightning can strike the same place. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it, it's more likely to strike the same place because like, like, like Mr. Jason was saying, it's, it's, that's a favorite location. It's at a high point. It's got a metal, uh, object sticking out at the top of it. So it's definitely, uh, a, a, more likely if it strikes there once, it's more likely to strike again. Um, can, can volcanoes cause lightning? I'm glad I already answered. Somebody else can answer this one. Anyone want to take it? Yes. Oh, yeah. Right. Yes. Right. Ashes from the volcanoes actually um, does the same uh, thing like the uh, particles in the atmosphere. So when they collide, they would uh, separate the charges. So some of the particles would be negatively charged or positively charged. And these particles will also produce lightning. Actually, there are a lot of cool videos and pictures online um, that had a lightning produced by volcanoes. 
So she mentioned pictures online. Uh, speaking of, here's one right here. Of wow. lightning induced by a volcano. So it's pretty cool. Um, so here, here's another myth for you guys. Um, when I have either the rubber of my car keeps me safe because of, I'm safe in the car because Miss Emily talked about you're safe in your car and, and uh, the myth is it's because it's the rubber of the tires. Is that true or false? No, I'm going to say I'm going to say false and I'll tell you why because this is this is the story that I like to tell when I'm out giving presentations and I say that it's actually the metal cage like the Faraday cage concept of your car metal roof metal size that kind of diverts it around you through the chassis and then into the ground but I was actually given this talk not long ago and I had a tire expert with me and mentioned something about I don't know if it's uh, with the gases inside our side or something about the steel belted radials or something but he argued me down and said the tires did help protect us but it was not the rubber in the tires but the compound that the rubber is currently made of so i don't know if anyone wants to chime in on that or not but i will say if the tires do help out a lot i can guarantee you that the metal structure of the car helps a lot more and you got something to add there yeah i think um yeah, I agree. It's the casing around that really helps. And did you all see the motorcyclist who unfortunately um, was killed the other day by lightning in uh, yes. Volusia County, Florida? Yes. Uh, so unfortunately, I think that's an example. You know, he's riding a motorcycle. That tire has rubber, but he doesn't have that casing around him to deflect the energy. And, and this is what I tell the students at school, because I have students saying, you know, I got my rubber sole tennis shoes on. I should be safe from the lightning. And, and, and like uh, Jason said, the rubber of the tires, uh, they may give you some small amount of uh, protection. But you know what? I tell people lightning just passed through anywhere from one to five miles of the atmosphere. Is one inch of rubber really going to stop it? And the, the, the answer is no. It's gonna. It's yeah. Like like Mr. Jason said, a lot of times that lightning strikes the top of the car, the antenna, of the top of the car passes down the side. I, I you know, electricity is a lot like uh, water. It's a it can be considered like a fluid. So if you pour water on top of a car, it doesn't kind of go straight in. It flows on the outside. The electricity does the same thing. Flows down the sides of the car. Well, actually, the the electrical current will flow down the side of the car, go down the axles, and actually, I've heard stories that it actually shoots holes through the tires. And then, like Mr. Jason said, a lot of times to make our tires safe or stronger, they put a big metal belt in them. So again, we've talked about how metal uh, can uh, attract or help conduct electricity. It doesn't attract uh, the lightning bolt, but can actually conduct it. So um, definitely, you're safe, and you are definitely safe in the car, but not for the reason a lot of people think. It's because of that that Faraday cage, that metal cage that uh, we were talking about. Okay, I've got one more. I got one more uh, myth here. You know, uh, and. Uh, when when a person is struck by lightning, they still have some of that electrical current in them, so you don't want to touch them to help them. True or false? I, that's false. Yeah, it's obviously obviously false. The body doesn't hold a current that long. I would actually argue that if someone is struck by lightning, one of the first things you need to do is rush to that person and start CPR because that could be the difference between life and death. Oh, I do have one more. I do have one more kind of fact or, or interesting uh, thing to say. When, uh, when lightning strikes the beach or the sand, it actually can form a uh, petrified lightning strike. Is that true or false? I'm going to say I, I'm going to say it's true. Uh, I haven't seen it myself because we don't have a lot of beaches here in the desert south of the southwest of El Paso where we live. But I have been up to where they tested the uh, nuclear bomb up to the north of us here many many years ago, and there was places where the immense heat from that actually did kind of crystallize uh, some of the soil up that way. So I would think with the heat that you're talking about, that fifty thousand degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to say yes. Am I right or wrong? You are correct. And there actually is a name for it, believe it or not. And it is called a fulgurite. And here I have kind of a cool image of one. 
uh, that wow. they uh, they were able to uh, dig up out of the sand. So it makes some kind of crazy patterns in that sand. And like I said, it it's actually fuses all of that that quartz that this sand is made of and into a, a kind of a glass tube. And if you're so lucky to find one on the beach uh, or in the sand, uh, it kind of looks like this. It's just a little glass tube. Now, you know, we've kind of been hammering away that lightning is bad. Lightning hurts people, kills animals, kills people. But actually, lightning does do a good service. And um, it actually takes some of the nitrogen of the atmosphere and uh, changes it in a way that uh, makes it beneficial. Uh, Dr. Zhang, can you kind of comment on this uh, what is it called, the, the nitrogen fixation that lightning causes? Yes, so um, so when lightning strikes, the high uh, temperature would um, make the nitrogen in the atmosphere become the what we call NOx, which is um, the nutrients for the soil and um, some of the agricultural products. Um, and um, I believe it's 50% of the... Um, naturally produced, uh, Knox was produced by lightning. That's impressive. So, you know, as, as much harm as we've talked about lightning producing, it does actually do some good. It actually produced some nutrients that our trees and plants uh, do need. So that, that is fascinating, very interesting. So I thank you for kind of uh, uh, illuminating us on this. Ha <laughs> that pun was intended by the way. Um, Let's see, what else uh, I did want to talk about real quickly, because uh, we, we talked about how hot is the lightning. Oh, you know, Miss Emily, you're there up at kind of elevation uh, in the mountains there. I know during the, at the beginning, one of the threats that we have at the start of monsoon season, when we're starting just to get some of the moisture in there to get these thunderstorms going, we get a lot of what's called dry lightning. Uh, what are the threats that are associated with dry lightning? So uh, like we were mentioning earlier, um, certainly if you're in an area and maybe it's not raining, uh, you can still be hit by lightning during the beginning of the monsoon season. We get sort of just enough moisture to make thunderstorms develop, um, but we're not getting a lot of rain from those thunderstorms right away. Uh, so, you know, certainly you don't have to have rain where you are to be struck by lightning. Another problem to think about um, before monsoon season typically uh, hasn't necessarily been the case so far, far this year, but typically, uh, you know, May and June are very dry months, uh, the beginning of June. So we start to see the ground really dry out, all of the um, trees and the ground cover dry out. Um, and when we get these thunderstorms with dry lightning, we can have forest fires start. Uh, so that is another concern as well um, when you're dealing with dry lightning uh, is the wildfire risk. And we uh, actually have already uh, in our area here in Flagstaff had at least one uh, wildfire that began from a lightning strike. So um, it's definitely a danger to consider as well. Very true, very true. And I, she, she, she kind of I kind of set her up with that one because she hit the, both the points that I wanted her to talk about, it, especially with that, that dry lightning uh, that can start the forest fires. I know that it seems like there's a point towards the end of June where any day we get a thunderstorm going up, we get that dry lightning, the next day they're talking about a small forest, you know, a fire has started. Uh, and actually sometimes I've seen it takes a couple days because that lightning strikes that tree or whatever it is and it kind of smolders. And then finally some wind comes along and starts to kind of fan it and get going. So I've seen it take several days sometimes for people to even notice that there's actually a, a large enough fire going that they need to take some quick action on that. Certainly here in northern Arizona, especially in the Flagstaff area, we have very um, gusty southwest winds in the afternoon a lot of times. And so, yeah, certainly a lightning strike can happen uh, and then smolder for a couple of days before we get some, some stronger southwest winds and be a problem much later, certainly. Very good. I want to touch on one subject because, gosh, it's already been almost an hour, and then we're going to wrap things up. So one more time I want to say, um, if you do have a, a last-minute question for our panelists, uh, use that hashtag uh, monsoon, hashtag monsoon2019, or drop me an email at tim.brice at noaa.gov. I want to talk real quickly because we've talked about the hazards of people outside, uh, but uh, I, I did want to touch real quickly because yesterday when we were talking about downburst winds, we talked about how um, a threat uh, downburst winds are to the aviation community. And I don't know if any of you guys want to chime in on this. Um, 
What kind of threat does lightning possess to the aviation community? Mind you guys are thinking about an answer. I will show a cool video. <laughs> Click on the right button here. So this is an airplane taking off, I believe, from New Zealand. And you'll see zap. So, and the plane did not drop out of the sky. Um, I, I believe if, if I, if memory serves correct, there, there's only been one attested uh, case where lightning uh, struck an airplane and actually uh, went in and in some way worked its way, the lightning went in and worked its way into the part of the plane where the fuel was kept and actually ended up uh, igniting some fuel that was in the plane's uh, wing and actually caused the, the plane to come down. But like you saw in that video, uh, again, a plane is all metal. And in theory, when uh, lightning strikes one side of the plane, it should either travel from tip, wingtip to wingtip or from nose to tail uh, and exit out that way. Again, that lightning if it has to choose between going through the air or something made of metal. It's going to make it be, go through that metal, but all it does is usually pass through. And uh, I think not on a regular basis, but relative, it's not rare for a airplane to be struck by lightning. So they have all the equipment on the inside, uh, all, all the, uh, the electronics, all the aviation uh, controls. They're all very heavily insulated between, uh, from being, you know, affected by that lightning. So, um, yeah. I was just I was just looking up that incident you talked about. It was Pan Am Flight 214. It was in December of 1963, and the flight had started in Puerto Rico and had made it to uh, Baltimore and was on a leg between Baltimore and Philadelphia when it was struck uh, and ignited that. Uh, but I do know that I was on a flight once, a Delta flight between Atlanta and here in El Paso, and this was probably about three and a half, four years ago. Uh, when we landed, we were informed that the we had actually incurred a lightning strike uh but nobody on board even knew it had happened and oh, wow. when you when you look you could see a little black streak down the side there right past the door where you enter and exit where the lightning bolt went in and went out so i'm not sure i'm not an aeronautical engineer how these things are engineered now but but i do know that uh Outside that one account that we talk about there, there's never been a fatal accident caused by lightning, unlike winds. Yeah, unfortunately, that's so. All righty. Well, it's been almost an hour, and I want to be mindful of everyone's time. I didn't see any other questions via email or on Twitter. So as we wrap things up here, I'm going to go down the line and have everyone just kind of give their last kind of tip or uh, safety measure that uh, they think people should take because we – I, I'm sure we could have gone an entire another hour. I've got, you know, uh, the Weather Service has done breakdowns on, on lightning, you know, by age, uh, by age and gender. You can see uh, lightning seems to be attracted to men more than women. <laughs> it's actually that men are more likely to be outside fishing or playing golf. Uh, and, and some people actually say that men maybe aren't as smart as women and they don't want to go inside when they hear that. I don't know the truth of that or not, but... Um, but you can see uh, lightning fatalities by month really starts to ramp up as we, of course, go into the summer season. That's where we see, of course, more lightning activity, but it's also when more people are outdoors. So, you know, we, we could go on and on about this. Uh, this is a great, if you do uh, lightning fatality statistics, uh, this uh, document will come up. It's kind of fascinating to kind of go through it and see. So let me work my way down the line here and uh, see if we can get uh, just kind of last words of wisdom from every, everybody. And I'll start off with Miss Emily. My biggest uh, piece of advice is going to still be to have a plan. Um, you know, certainly you are going to want to go outside this summer and going to want to go enjoy uh, the outdoors. And that's fine. That's great. Um, but just have a plan in place um, for what you will do if thunderstorms uh, affect your area. So knowing those things we talked about, those safety tips, checking the forecast before you go. We're trying to do the best job we can do at the Weather Service uh, to give you the best information to make the best decisions. So we're gonna be letting you know when thunderstorms are coming, uh, you know, what times to expect them roughly. And just, you know, having an idea that thunderstorms are in the forecast that day and then having a plan uh, for what you will do with your family is vital. Very good, great words of wisdom. Just, you know, since we can't issue a lightning warning, cause like uh, Mr. Dan said earlier, we would be just doing 
tens of thousands of warnings, um, it, some of that falls back on you as a person. So have a plan and then keep mindful of what the weather is doing. Mr. Dan, do you have any last words of wisdom? Uh, yes. Um, don't let the rain make you dash inside. <laughs> let it be the thunder. You know, I you see often people outside, you know, the thunder's roaring and they're staying outside. And then when the rain hits, they dash inside. As we mentioned before, when thunder roars, go indoors. That lightning threat is there when you hear the thunder. Very good. So if you can hear the thunder, the lightning basically is close enough to get you. Mr. Jason, any last words of advice? Yeah, the key here is always be patient. I was watching the Women's World Cup match yesterday between Chile and Sweden. They had a lightning delay, and they said that it would be 50 minutes before they started playing again because they were going to follow that 30-30 rule of waiting 30 minutes after the last lightning flash before they brought people back out onto the field, and then they needed some time to warm up. So if you're at a ball game, you're at a concert, you're somewhere, and, and the local people that are putting that on tell you to go to shelter, and you're a little upset set, you paid the ticket price, you're ready for this to go. Remember, everybody's doing this for your own protection. And uh, it all goes along with that. As we said, you see a flash, make the dash. When thunder roars, go indoors. Very good. Very good. And last but certainly not least, our, our expert on today's call, um, Dr. Zhang, can you give us any last words of advice? Yes. So one of the fun facts is that the longest uh, lightning in record traveled um, 206 miles in Oklahoma. Um, it's not like, I'm not saying like every lightning will travel that far, but um, a typical lightning can travel is like 20 miles. Um, so that's why we have um, the word, uh, when thunder roars go indoors, even though you don't see it, um, it might just travel uh, in a long distance. Very true, very true. So I really appreciate everyone joining us today. Uh, one fun fact I'll throw out there for you that I was reading that in the in medieval times, back in the 1700s, uh, people believed that the ringing of church bells would actually scare the thunderstorms away. And oh, I wondered if one of my, my, my puppies would join us. So she's here, say hello. Um, so one of the, um, they believed that the ringing of church bells would uh, scare the lightning and the thunder away. So when a thunderstorm approached a town, one of these medieval towns, some poor person was sent off to ring the church bells. And apparently between like 1753 and 1768, like 150 of these bell ringers were dispatched due to the lightning striking the, uh, the uh, bell tower. And of course, if you think about it, it's the bell tower at a church is probably the tallest object in one of these small towns, and it's got a big metal bell up in it. It's it's actually the exact worst thing. Uh, it's it's going to be the probably the thing that struck. So, needless to say, they uh, they thought they decided that that wasn't the wisest thing to do during a thunderstorm. And then it wasn't until later, and we didn't even talk about this. You know, Ben Franklin and others were doing uh, lightning research there in the uh, 1700s, figuring out, uh, actually people didn't even understand that lightning was part of thunderstorms until uh, Ben Franklin and others were performing electrical experiments. We could talk about that for a while. I, I could just talk on and on about uh, lightning. I love lightning. So, but I'll, I'll let everyone go for tonight. I uh, really appreciate all of our guests, uh, Dan from San Diego, Emily from Flagstaff, Mr. Jason from El Paso, and Dr. Zhang, who's over there at the University of Arizona, getting ready to head off to the University of Maryland. So I appreciate everyone joining us on the call. Uh, this is our third in a row of five that we're doing this week. Uh, so we have another one tomorrow night, same time. And then we'll be talking about the monsoon threat of flash flooding. So if you're interested in that and like to go over, you know, some of the causes of flash flooding, some of the safety tips that you can take to protect you from uh, flash flooding, uh, be sure to join us uh, the same time. Uh, you can check your local NWS uh, uh, social media channels. They should post the, the link to it. Or you can go to the uh, uh, YouTube dot youtube.com slash NWS El Paso, and it'll have them listed there as uh, the scheduled hangout. So we got two more. Uh, on Friday, we'll do a wrap-up. We'll cover uh, 
we'll kind of do a review of everything that we did and we might even touch on uh fire weather and debris flow because we just didn't have time to talk about those so thank you to everybody who joined us on the call today thank you to the panelists you guys did a great job uh everyone stay safe be weather wise and uh, just uh just uh, when i like i said when you go out there have a plan and be safe so everyone have a great night talk to you later bye bye